And uh, it's a joy to be back here at uh, the University of Cardiff and uh, enjoying the city as well. I'd like to just introduce my wife also, Pam Roy, who knows probably more than I do, but um, I'll, she's, she has enough character to not reveal it too much. Uh, so, uh, but thank you, Kevin, for making it possible for me to be here today. And uh, I just, a few other things about me that might be um, important to you. Uh, my, I have a, a daughter uh, who is now living here in uh, uh, the UK, and uh, she married one of your tribe. Um, and so I now have two grandchildren uh, here who are dual US British citizens. And I've been, so you say I've been grandfathered into uh, your, into this country. So I'll be coming back and forth. I have mandatory visits now required. Since I'm a grandfather, I have to come frequently to uh, pay tribute. And uh, so I've been able to have a nice opportunity to do some personal work as well as some professional work. Um, also, I, just a little bit more on my, I guess, on my credentials. Um, I have been in the community food movement, as we call it in the United States now, for going on about 40 years, actually probably more than 40 years. Uh, most of that was what you might say on the ground, grassroots, working to develop all kinds of food projects, food programs, particularly interested in the needs of lower income communities in the uh, US. And uh, over perhaps 15 to 20 years ago, became much more interested in food policy thinking and knowing and feeling and experiencing uh, the fact that I could do a whole lot more if we had good policy backing up the work that was going on than if I just kept slogging away trying to develop all kinds of new food projects one place at a time. So I began to drift, you might say, into that, in that direction. Um, I had been working with an organization a for several years, an organization that I actually co-founded called the Community Food Security Coalition, uh, which unfortunately went out of business about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, and I had been doing food policy council work with them. One of the things I had done during my tenure as a, as a nonprofit food program director was in Hartford, Connecticut, was developing a food policy council there uh, for the city, and then later one for the state of Connecticut. So I, I, the state of Connecticut Food Policy Council later became, was actually the first state food policy council in the US, and uh, Hartford was one of the, one of the first um, city food policy councils. So I've been moving more in those directions to try to um, just expand what I felt was, is the need to engage local decision makers, local policy makers, uh, get them closer to food issues, in effect to put food on the table, on the public policy agenda. I feel that that's where it belongs. It's been a long time coming, but I think we're actually getting there. And I'm, I was t talking with some of your colleagues here just for a few minutes uh, to discover how much wonderful work is going on across this country and right here in Cardiff. And I have some we, Pam and I will have an opportunity to meet with some of you all here in Cardiff tomorrow. And then, um, <clears throat> tomorrow, uh, then also tomorrow we go up to Newcastle where there will be a, a one day workshop on Thursday on food policy councils. So it all works out nicely. I, I dispense my duties as a grandfather and I do all this work at the same time. So it's great, it's great to have this. Um, I should also say that um, since this this community food security coalition horse that I was riding got shot out from under me uh, a few, uh, several months ago, that I was, um, I was picked up, you might say, by, the, by Johns Hopkins University, their School of Public Health, uh, to do some work on food policy council. So we now have this new initiative, which I'm very excited about with Johns Hopkins, to try to organize more resources and direct those resources to the development of food policy councils and perhaps more broadly to look at what is the role of local food policy and local action in raising up uh, the importance of food, again, putting it on the, on the public policy agenda, 
trying to promote more sustainable food systems, food systems that are more uh, secure, uh, that address the needs of the most vulnerable populations, but really at the same time um, are reaching you know, more and more people with that message that we have to have a food system that's, that's fair, that's equitable, that's healthy, that's sustainable. There is a huge, huge emerging role for people doing this work at a local level to bring on, bring, bring in the, you know, the cities and the counties in the US, the states, in Canada, the provinces, and in across North America, we're also beginning to work with some of our indigenous people that, with our, our tribal communities as well. So it's a, a good times. If you're interested in food, it's really good times. And it's also a good time to buy a book. <laughs> so, you know, I just happen to be a kind of a book peddler at the same time, and I've written a couple. And uh, <clears throat> we have the special UK discount price of seven pounds, which took me several uh, hours <laughs> to calculate what that might be worth in US dollars. But it seems like seven pounds was a, the right number. So uh, happy to do business with you, happy to sign the book as well. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about what they are and what the difference is. So that's enough background on me. Uh, we're, I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to have in a little bit. I want to share a few thoughts, of course. Um, a few, one thing that keeps striking me when I, when I think about how the food movement has grown over the last just few years, how far we've come, you know, how far we've come since those kind of, those bad old days, those dark ages. And um, I did a little research actually on, on, the, on how, our, how the food system sort of evolved after World War II. And I was particularly interested in what happened the year I was born. In the year I was born, the microwave oven was invented. Minute rice came on the market. The Dunkin' Donuts chain got its start. I don't know for, I guess we don't have Dunkin' Donuts in uh, the UK, but Dunkin' Donuts is a, perhaps one of the larger purveyors of fat and sugar in the world. Krispy <clears throat> uh, Kreme. It's very much, it kind of is, it, I would say Krispy Kreme is, pales in comparison to Dunkin' Donuts. But anyway, they opened their first store the year I was born. You also may remember fondly um, the uh, Kraft's processed food, uh, processed cheese, which came in single, little wrapped singles in plastic. And those, those were invented, if that's the right word, uh, the year I was born. And sugar pops. Sugar pops came on the market, Kellogg's sugar pops. So you could say that in that year, uh, I was born under the kind of holy American trinity of convenience, fat, and sugar. That's just to give you an idea of how far we've come, that we're moving in a direction away from that. It's still there, it's still a problem, but we're beginning to move away from the, that period. Um, now my mother was a very sort of, you might say she was very modern <clears throat> in the sense that all those products appealed to her immensely. And I was kind of a, 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 a I was somebody she experimented with all the time. All that food was ingested by me. Um, and my mother still doesn't apologize for any of that, but either way, that was the life that we had. The culture, the food culture, if you want to call it, culture is a funny word to describe uh, something as, uh, as uh, unfortunate as our early, early food system, post-World War II food system. But there's other things as well. Other things that we need to be paying attention to, and I think other things that are driving this food movement, this food, food policy, food movement everywhere. In the U.S., uh, 15, and I, unfortunately I am going to be using a lot of U.S. figures, but I hope that we, I, I'm sure we have uh, U.K. equivalents. 15% of our population is, is food insecure, meaning they don't know where their next meal is going to be coming from, essentially. Um, <clears throat> Probably about 5% are considered hungry, meaning they have severe food insecurity, <laughs> using our definitions. In other words, food poverty is very high. Um, many communities uh, are food deserts. They have very limited access to healthy and affordable food. Uh, supermarkets had abandoned many of our urban areas. 
And since I moved to New Mexico, which I didn't mention earlier, but I had moved to New Mexico about 10 years ago, I learned about rural food deserts as well. But more interestingly, uh, we've, we've been, I think, saturated with food swamps. Are people familiar with food swamps? Have you heard that term? Places that get overrun by fast food places, convenience food places, places that basically are purveyors of unhealthy food. And so this, this has been sort of a pattern of food deserts, the emptying out of a place for, uh, of places that sold healthy and affordable food, and this influx of places that sold unhealthy food. So we have this challenge as well. Um, certainly in the US, we see these problems affecting low-income communities more severely than they do higher income communities. But we're seeing big problems in the food system across the board, so irrespective of income, geography, and so forth. Climate change, drought. 60% uh, of the US experienced drought in last year, in 2012, 60%. That's the worst since 1954. Just in near, not too far from me, uh, in Texas, one beef processor shut down completely, laying off 2,000 workers because there were no cattle. The cattle had been sold off by ranchers, and were, they were not producing because they didn't have enough water, didn't have enough grass. The price of feed had gone so high. We are expecting 9 billion people on the planet by 2050, and many agronomists are telling us we're not sure how we're going to feed all those people. Um, obesity and diet-related illnesses are spreading like wildfire. Um, I'm very sad to say that many of those kind of companies that I mentioned or alluded to in the beginning um, have you know, decided they've saturated the US market, so they're looking for markets overseas. And they are now showing up in, in, de in the developing nations across the globe in the same way that we we're so successful in marketing cigarettes to um, developing nations. We are now uh, marketing uh, unhealthy food. 65% uh, of the US population is obese or overweight. And according to the Center for Disease Control, which is our main agency for tracking public health issues, uh, and problems, including those related to diet, um, one third of all Americans will be diabetic by the, by the year 2050, unless there is a substantial change in eating patterns and physical activity. Uh, now, you may not know, but the leading reason for rejection of recruits in the US military is now obesity. Now, I'm an ardent fan of world peace, but being too fat to fight is not the way to achieve it. Now, for these reasons, I think alone, and there's many more, we have to start to pay attention. And this is why we're beginning to see more action at the local level and at the state level, and we're also seeing it at the national level. Um, we are actually beginning to be a little bit more intentional about our food system. We're thinking about the future of our food system. And we're beginning to think about what would a highly functioning, sustainable, food system look like. And we're really interested in ones that are regionally based. We're not so interested in thinking about you know, food coming from all over the US or all over the world. We see too many problems in our food supply, too many problems in the food chain. And we need to be able to begin to regionalize our work more. Um, to me, the big, a big part of the answer a big way that we're going to move in the direction of more regional and sustainable food systems is by engaging more citizens. So when I talk about food policy today, I'm really going to be talking more about the process, the way that we bring people into, the, into this whole, this whole uh, arena, um, uh, how we engage people. Engagement to me is really the ticket we're looking at, not so much the fine points of the policy, which of course are important, but I think it's much more about how we begin to engage people and whether or not that's happening well enough at this point. Um, 
I, what, I, what I see happening, I see kind of three paradigms, you might say, within the evolution of the food movement. We, I see one where we have some, some interesting and good food policy going on, uh, but it tends to be top down, it tends to be almost promulgated by you know, a few uh, innovative and creative leaders. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City might be one example of somebody who has been very out front on public health, relating it to food, uh, but not a person who really is enamored with democracy, not a person who wants to bring in the citizens themselves into the process. Um, we, have another, we have another condition, which is where we have lots of energetic, excited people becoming involved in food policy work, but they're not really well trained. They're not well organized, and they're not quite sure how policy is made. They want to make something happen. They're very interested in that, but they're not quite sure how to proceed, and they don't form good working partnerships with the public sector as a result, and often end up with kind of a mishmash approach, which is not effective. And then we have the third paradigm, which is the one that I really do favor, and that is where we begin to bring citizens together in a partnership framework with policymakers. We get them together at the same table, sharing ideas, developing a working relationship. One is learning from the other. You, know, the, you might say the top is learning from those at the grassroots, and at the same time, the grassroots is learning how policy is made, how government actually works. I think we have, at least in the US, a real ignorance, a real gap in terms of our policy making process. We don't quite get it. Um, so that's really that third model is the one that I'm looking at. And it's not just because it's a good idea, perhaps in terms of values or ideals, to be engaging citizens, even though you know, we all probably subscribe to the principles of democracy. We probably need to think about why that is important. Why do we want to engage people? If we get a few good leaders making good, relatively good policy in the food world, why do we really care about citizen involvement? Well, I have three reasons um, that I, I like. One comes out of the work of um, Amartya Sen, you know, who turned during a, life, a Nobel laureate economist who lifetime of research on, on uh, political economies, on uh, famine, among other things, on poverty, found that in a working democracy, a functioning democracy, where there is transparency, where there is free, some degree of freedom of the press, where information, in other words, is flowing, uh, and there's some access to government and some accountability, there's never been a famine. There haven't really been serious, serious food problems, even in very poor countries. Now, that, that idea, that concept, while I think it needs to be a little bit better understood and, decon and, and deciphered, began to really make sense to me because as I was doing work in communities, particularly when it became looking at food policy, I realized that you had different camps where people weren't talking to each other, where information was not flowing, it was not being shared, government wasn't really accountable to people when it came to food, oftentimes they weren't really accountable to people in other areas as well, only in theory, not really in practice. And I give one example I use from my days in Hartford, Connecticut, where we were working with, um, the US has many, many national food programs. Um, one of them, which is called Women, Infant, and Children, provides uh, nutrition benefits to low-income moms and uh, children up to the age of five. And we had discovered that that program had suddenly sustained a big drop in the caseload. It had gone from 10,000 people down to 5,000 people almost overnight. And this was our Food Policy Council. Our Food Policy Council is sitting around the table Somebody there knew that this had happened, shared the information with others. Other people in the room began to provide information and ask questions, and it kind of went back and forth and back and forth until we realized we had a serious problem, and we had to find out what was going wrong. 
and we started to explore as a group of about 15 people. And uh, we found out that the city, which had been operating the program, had basically screwed up in many ways. They had closed a clinic. Um, they had not given people information. They were just being very bureaucratic and very sloppy. And as a result, um, all these people had left the program without any information. Together, as a Food Policy Council, we brought this to the attention of our elected officials. We showed, we talked to them about where the failures were, how to fix it, and if they didn't fix it, we were going to go to the press. That access to the press, accountability, transparency, a group of people sitting around the table together who could collectively share information was what was necessary in order to break that logjam. And as a result of that, we were able to restore those people who had been left the program and actually ended up with a much better program later on. We also see that there is a policy, part of policy making which has to be inspired by citizens. In a way, it almost seems to be required. And the best example I have is the recent one from New York City. Um, I don't know if you have followed our soda wars, where, people, where we have, uh, among other things, um, said we're, we're all getting supersized because we're drinking supersized sodas and eating supersized meals. Soda is certainly one of the biggest purveyors of, a, of, of, our, of, of sugar and calories, unnecessary calories. And Mayor Bloomberg, again, being a very public health-minded mayor, decided that he should impose a cap on the size of sodas. No <coughs> soda larger than 16 ounces should be sold in the city of New York. And so he promulgated that regulation. Unfortunately, again, as I said earlier, the mayor not being a firm believer in engaging citizens um, didn't have the support of his own city council. He didn't necessarily have the support of his own citizens. And he found himself fighting the state court, which eventually overturned his decision and said, you cannot impose a cap on the size of soft drinks, soda, soda drinks. The court, the, the court termed this arbitrary and his actions as arbitrary and capricious, meaning that it really did not rise to the level of public policy. Public policy being a place where lots of people and your elected officials become engaged in a discussion and decisions get made in an open forum and in a more uh, organized fashion than, than one person is um, uh, issuing an executive fiat. So the argument is, and this has been, we've been having some discussions about this among, uh, you, might, you might check with a professor at uh, the New School in New York on this if you want to look at, do a little background research. His name is uh, Nevin Cohen. And um, basically saying this, the courts could very well have decided to allow this cap on sodas if the public had been consulted, if the city, if the elected officials had been consulted, if in fact this was real policy. So it gives you more oomph, in other words, if you're bringing in citizens. My third point around the need to engage people as opposed to just having individuals take action, is people want change. It's become very clear that people are very dissatisfied with our food system today. And the time has come to pay attention to that. Some of the polls that have been done in the US are very interesting. The Kellogg Foundation did one about two years ago that found 93% of Americans want everyone to have equal access to fresh fruits and vegetables. 93% actually want people, think that it's important for everybody to be able to do that, regardless of where they live, how much money they have, or who they are. They also, 97% of them want food to be healthy. And that might seem obvious, who would not want food to be healthy, but I think it suggests how public consciousness has raised to the point where healthy food is now something we, we, we understand and we all, almost all, desire. And there's a kind of a social justice component to this as well. 88% of those polled found that, or were said that they were willing to pay more for food if they knew that farm workers were being paid fairly. 
In other words, the relationship between healthy and affordable food and those people who are working in the food system, making a living, whether it's a farm worker or <coughs> processing or cooking or, or whatever, whatever aspect of the food system, that they should be paid a living wage, in other words, to be able to, to actually be able to buy food, among other things. That kind of consciousness is growing. A different survey, uh, this was done by the Pew, uh, the Pew Foundation, found that 60% of people want government <coughs> to intervene to reduce childhood obesity. Um, that, you know, there's been this whole criticism around, you know, invasive action or intrusive action on the part of government, particularly when it comes to, uh, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, restricting whether it's the size of soft drinks or restricting large fast food uh, organizations, uh, corporations, um, you know, basically telling us what we should eat. 60% of the people actually want government to become involved. Um, we've had a raging debate in the US recently over genetically engineered food. And as far as we've been able to get with it, unfortunately, is just to look at labeling. That we feel that the consumer has the right to know if this food, the ingredients in this package are coming from genetically engineered uh, crops. Um, the Los Angeles Times found that 60% of the state of California wanted labels, uh, G GE labels. But there was a big referendum there, a big vote last November. The, uh, the food industry spent $45 million to defeat this measure, which would have required labeling of products containing genetically engineered food. The other side could only muster about $9 million you know, welcome to um, uh, democracy in the U.S. So from that 60%, it dwindled down to about 47% of the electorate saying they wanted to have those kinds of labels after, um, after all that expend, after they'd already, after that kind of expenditure was made. People want change. I'm convinced they want change. I think it's time for us to be able to bring in, bring people together in a way that we think will actually begin to turn the tables and create the kind of food system that, we're, that really is more expressive of our values. Um, there's, there's so much more going on and it's very exciting. I mean, just little things, little things that I find intriguing. A little town in Montana, Missoula, Montana, of all places. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Missoula, Montana. But, um, they, had a, they had a local ordinance come before their city council that simply said that it would be okay if you raised chickens in your backyard. Chickens in your, seems harmless enough. Well, this has risen to the level of public policy and really begins to kind of divide citizens and creates camps, pro-chicken, anti-chicken. And in Missoula, this issue was so big that 300 people showed up at a public hearing on whether or not to allow people to raise chickens in their backyards. The measure passed, it was allowed. People now, you'll hear lots of chuckling and, what's the word, chuckling? Not chuckling. Roost, roost, roosters and hens and everybody making noises when you drive through Missoula. But one, one comment was from a city official was that this was the most people that had ever shown up at a public hearing in that city on any issue ever, on chickens. And this is not unusual. This is not unusual. We're seeing food planning take off, food <laughs> strategies, food charters. You're, you're doing that work here. Uh, you know, whether it's London or Cardiff or Bristol. Um, um, I was in Australia several months, about a year ago, where, uh, that, where Australia is engaged in a food planning process. The state of Victoria is spending $5 million on the development of 12 local food policy councils. On, it's under their health department. Uh, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, we'll talk about it later, but they just recently completed a whole food planning process that I think is actually a model of citizen engagement, and I'll get into that in a, in a bit. I was in South Korea not too long ago, and the city of Seoul is also engaged in developing a food plan there. Uh, New York City uh, in, is, again, they are, they're kind of coming along, they're fighting that sort of battle with their mayor, um, to establish a food policy council in uh, New York City. 
Uh, they have many plans. There's a one called Food Works, which is probably the best known one. And that actually has 59 very specific proposals to address different aspects of their food system from access to health to purchasing, to urban gardens, to the infrastructure need, needed in order to um, support a healthy regional food system. Um, but they still don't have a way to engage citizens. And that, that battle is still being waged there. But at least the food planning work has been going on for a while. Um, so all of this, to me, is I, I find just really stunning pros, uh, progress. Um, keep in mind that I'm a person who has been at this for quite a while. I, um, you know, when I first proposed to the city of Hartford, Connecticut in the early 1980s that they start a food policy council, they looked at me like I had just landed there from Mars. You know, they rolled their eyeball, eyeballs. They had no idea what food policy meant, or why a city, of all things, should be involved in that. So we have, and that was typical. In fact, at the time, the city was fairly progressive compared to others. We've come a long way in that regard. Um, what I, where I think we have begun to you know, show some real progress and where we are beginning to demonstrate some capacity to move this food policy work along at the local level is with food policy councils. I know, are people familiar with what they are? Do you, have you heard the term? You raise your hand if you've at least heard the term. Okay, we're, it's basically a collection <laughs> of people of stakeholders, people involved in doing food system work, both public sector, government, as well as private or NGOs. And um, you know, they are there to, in one way or another to try to shape the direction of your food system, primarily through the use of public policy. And they're there to influence policy. They're not there necessarily to undertake food programs or projects. They're there to actually try to move policy along at the local level. In the US, there's been a pretty substantial growth. Just about 10 years ago, there were 50 local and state food policy councils. And that's in North America. We, the work I've been doing is with Canada and the US. Um, in just two years, or in 2010, uh, we undertook a, a census of food policy councils and found 111 in 2010 in North America. Uh, we did the census again in 2012, just last year, and we found 200, almost a doubling in the number of food policy councils in just two years. And based on what I've been just doing, running around the country, talking to people and getting fielding requests for information and so forth, I would say the number is probably much higher than 200 right now. It's really approaching exponential growth. Um, and, and when I say food policy councils, I'm not including a lot of more oh, looser efforts, you might say, networks, uh, coalitions, you know, group people coming together to try to kind of improve some one or more aspects of their food system, but not necessarily engaged with policy. So there's, if, if you added in those kinds of groups, it would certainly be hundreds more across the US. They're organized in different ways, um, in addition to representing different <coughs> sectors of the food system. They, um, <clears throat> they are oftentimes very closely associated with government, with local government. They may even be a part of local government. In the US, we still have this sort of anti-government independent streak. Um, my wife is one of those people who's in the <laughs> they have Their food policy council operates uh, independently of the government. And there's good reasons for that in many places, that that, that, that needs to happen. Um, and then there's sort of various hybrid versions. But in other words, there is indeed a relationship with government. And it's that relationship which leads, in my opinion, to the most policy change. It's developing working relationships with people, as I said earlier, who know what's going on on the ground, as well as with those people who know what's going on in government. So you know, the, I won't go too much into the structure of, of them. I have a whole different presentation on that. But I do see this as a really fascinating manifestation of citizen participation and the growing awareness of food as a top tier issue. 
Now at Johns Hopkins, um, I, I've had the opportunity to do things like research, which I've never really done a lot of before. I usually just make things up. I try not to have too much evidence uh, in, my, in my statements. But it, it's amazing when you work with the, with the academy, you suddenly have to have something to back you up. So one of the pieces of research that Johns Hopkins undertook was a survey of food policy councils. They found that 90% of them are indeed engaged with policy work. That's good. 95% report doing this work through some process of problem identification. In other words, they're actually going out and assessing their food system. Community food assessments are a very popular <coughs> early stage strategy in the development of food policy councils. We want, to, you know, we want to know where the food is coming from. We want to know who is hungry and who is not. We want to know where the food deserts and the food swamps are. We want to know how we can begin to fill the gaps that exist within our food system. 62% are developing policy, actually developing policy proposals such as food plans or food strategies or charters. Um, you know, these numbers actually surprised me because I wasn't, I didn't necessarily think that the food policy councils were that well organized. But in fact, they have been doing some really, you know, pretty thorough work. And what's, one thing you have to keep in mind is that oftentimes these food policy councils are not well staffed. They're often, sometimes they have no paid staff at all. Sometimes they're working purely as volunteers. Sometimes one of the organizations that are a member might have some resources or time or some part-time person who they can contribute to this process. So that they're able to do this much work at all suggests to me at least the degree of passion that people are bringing to that work. Um, almost half of the food policy councils actually do lobbying. So they're in there, they're at City Hall, they're at, our, at the state legislature looking for some bill to be passed or some action to be taken. The big issues that we're working on in the US are access to food, making sure that people have access to healthy and affordable food. The other, other big categories include promotion of urban agriculture. Urban agriculture has become a big deal. Unconventional forms of food production, you might say, are big deals. Also farmland <coughs> preservation. So making sure we ensure that we have the capacity to produce food, natural resources, land, et cetera, water. And another big category is procurement of local food. Um, in other words, using public dollars to support local food production by actually giving a preference in the purchase of that food on the part of public uh, institutions, whether it's schools or other places. So those are the kind of the big issue, big category issues that food policy councils are working on. I'll give you one example um, of one. This is uh, kind of my, my one of my favorite um, in terms of a, of a place and a process that I think has been rather, rather remarkable. And it's Cleveland, Ohio, um, which has been a, a city, a hurting city for a long time, a city of socio and economic, socioeconomic problems that are are among the most serious in the country. They have lost literally half of their population over a course of 15 years because of decline. It's, a, it's considered a rust belt city. It's a place where there, there's not a lot of economic opportunity. <coughs> a decline in the steel industry, among other reasons, being uh, attributed, are, are attributed to the decline in the population. They have a lot of problems, in other words. They have chosen to look at food as one way, as one strategy to begin to revitalize their city. You know, they found that in addition to losing their population, the population that was left was poor and often um, had severe health problems related to diet. There were tremendous food deserts and food swamps in Cleveland. And they decided, what can we do? What resources can we bring to bear on, this, on all these issues? A food policy council was formed there about five years ago. And they sort of took apart every, all the functions of city government. They kind of took it and pulled all the pieces out, and all, looked at all the mechanics, how things worked. And they discovered several things that were resources. One was zoning. How do we make sure that land 
can be used for certain things? And can we give some preference to food production, urban agriculture, community gardening, um, even food businesses? How can we begin to orient our land use code, reorient our land use code to favor agriculture and other food businesses? They then went to kind of the easy stuff, like Missoula, Montana. They passed a regulation that allows you to raise chickens and bees in your backyard. And in Cleveland, a backyard won't be much bigger than this room. And you can have chickens and a, one beehive in that space. Uh, they looked at their economic development uh, funds and decided we want to give priority use for those funds to um, food businesses. We want to actually begin to move some of that funding into food businesses, an intentional action on the part of the city to use those economic development funds. They then went to the other end of their, uh, you might say, the spectrum of their functions and looked at procurement and said, we, have, we buy food. Even though we're not a very wealthy city, we are buying food. We have money to buy food for our schools, our hospitals, our prisons, and so forth. And they gave a preference to food that was produced, actually even in the city itself, as well as food that was produced within about a 200 mile radius of Cleveland. And you know, directing those dollars to food producers actually has begun to stimulate that, you know, the, the agricultural environment. Um, and they even went sort of conceptually and philosophically to a, another level where they began to look at how they can um, you know, make link health policy to food policy, to economic development. All those things kind of came on together in their, as their thinking kept evolving. And the Food Policy Council was very much at the center of that evolution of their thinking. Um, and that evolution but had a very practical, that philosophical evolution had a very practical expression by, of, of the functions that city government <coughs> had available to it to address food. At the same time, there was the, you know, the Food Policy Council had like, they ha I don't know how they operate sometimes. They have about 75 people show up to meetings. It sounds more like a Congress or a, or a legislature meeting rather than you know, a group of people sitting around the table. Um, but they're very, very much out there, very much stirring up people, bringing them in. And that has, I think, in my opinion, has moved the conversation about food very rapidly in, through uh, Cleveland. Um, but all of this, this is the good news. I've been giving you the good news so far. I'm going to give you a little bit of what I think are the challenges at this point. And as much as we have all this opportunity in front of us, and as much as we have some pretty good examples, we still don't yet have the capacity we need to move the ball down the field much more aggressively and effectively than we have been. And that's where I think we need to start to invest in this idea of citizen engagement. We need to invest in the process itself of bringing people to the table. You know, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of us to sit down and you know, talk with the city official about policy. It's not something we're born with, I don't think, as an instinct. We don't always learn our, our civic skills very well. Um, we certainly don't have many opportunities to practice them. So we find that with food policy councils, there's been a real challenge in their ability to actually <coughs> understand how policy is made, um, how to work together as a group of people. How do I work together with people who don't necessarily share exactly the same ideas or values that I have, or don't necessarily come out of the same sector of the food system that I come from? What if I'm a you know, very sort of nonprofit oriented, charitably, community oriented person sitting down with somebody who's fairly, you know, somebody, somebody like Steve Garrett maybe, you know, that kind of personality. Sitting down with some hardcore business person who, you know, how do you get your values in sync? How do you agree on policies that the whole city should be working on together? These are serious, serious challenges and I think we have to start to pay attention. Again at Johns Hopkins, we're exploring how we can do more do a better job of building citizen food policy, citizen-driven food policy. And um, we've, done, we've been doing some surveys and some focus groups with people in the field. We find that they, 
They often, um, you know, they're under-resourced, as I said before, they're understaffed. They lack policy experience. They don't often understand how government works. And one, a group of people I was working with in Colorado had done, in a community uh, there, had done some tremendous work on organizing their citizens, had done a tremendous community food assessment, all the research, they'd, they'd even held uh, several large meetings. And I asked them, well, that's great. How are you going to get this information you've developed and these ideas you have to be enacted as policy by your, by your city? And they said they had no idea. They had no idea how they were going to do this because they had not talked to anybody yet at the city. They weren't even sure. The person I spoke to wasn't even sure where City Hall was. We have a problem when you do all this great organizing work but you're not connecting with the people who actually make policy. In Evansville, Indiana, um, a group had received a multi-million dollar, three-year grant to develop, among other things, a food policy council. I came in to try to work with them. I came to one meeting that was run entirely by and for professionals. Um, it did not have any participation by food producers of any kind. Uh, there were no people of color. It did not have, it was a very white, non, very, lacked all diversity. And I say it was probably the worst run meeting I have ever gone to in my life. And this was being run by people with substantial number of letters after their name. They were well credentialed. They didn't seem to have the basic organizing skills or community skills that were necessary. And yet they were, be they were being given millions of dollars to try to uh, sort of redirect their food system in a more in a healthier direction. So these are just examples of some of the problems we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> there's often no opportunity to network or to conference together, for people to work together, to learn from each other, to do some peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning. We're trying to say, all right, what are the networks that we can create and support so that people can learn some of these skills from each other? And as I said earlier, we're, they're, we're dealing with, you know, the, the food system is huge, as you know, and it's very complicated. And here we are taking people often who are, who are well-intentioned citizens with some program or project experience often, sitting down together and um, trying to figure out how to make all these pieces fit together, how to in fact create something that is a food system that connects all the dots, health, economy, education, um, the, um, you know, all the, all the, we have, as I, you know, we're, we're over social service in the United States. We have probably more federal food programs. I, I counted 15 last time I conducted a count of 15 official U.S. Department of Agriculture food programs. <laughs> I would bore you to death if I ever tried to explain them all. But just that bureaucracy alone is absolutely daunting to people who are trying to figure out how to make it work in a particular place. Somebody gives you a lot of money from way up here in Washington, DC. It's going to trickle down to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Hartford, Connecticut. How do, I make, how do I get the most out of those resources? People can't figure that out easily. It's very complicated. So again, I feel that we need to begin to find ways to, as a colleague from Toronto, Rod McRae, has referred, create a joined up food policy, joining up these different, these disparate parts of our food system into one common health oriented, sustainably oriented food policy. And this is the challenge that food policy councils, not just food policy councils, but governments all over the world face. How do we bring together these different parts into one place? And a, I'd encourage you to look at some of the work of, of Rod McRae, who, who writes extensively and eloquently on many subjects, but he's definitely, in my mind, one of the great public health and food system gurus out there. So I would definitely check out some of his work. Um, I want to move along here and just say that, uh, oh, there's one other element, of course, that we have to be cognizant of. We can't help but do so, and that's the um, you know, the, it, when you do become successful, as you know, when you start to actually achieve some of the things that you've said you're going to do, and 
you've sort of taken on the system and you've maybe made a few enemies, people start to push back at you. They begin to give you a hard time. You know, they don't let you um, go too far with what you've done. And there is a lot to lose in our food system when it comes to the for-profit sector that wants to sell us a lot of food that is frankly killing us. Um, and they will stop at nothing, and I mean nothing, to perpetuate uh, you know, the development, the marketing, the distribution of unhealthy food, of, of farming operations that, that are inhumane, hurt the environment, destroy the water and the air, and often produce a very unhealthy product. There's a lot, there's billions of dollars that are, there's hundreds of billions of dollars that are at stake in that part of our food system. There's billions of dollars being spent to market that food, unhealthy. McDonald's alone is spending $1 billion a year to sell its products. Most of that money is going to trying to sell that food to children. Um, so what, how does a food policy council operate in that environment? Well, it's not easy. It's certainly not easy to be able to do that. Regulations are being developed at the local level, trying to restrict, for instance, among other things, the location of fast food places so that they actually can't be near a school. In, uh, the, in the city of San Francisco, they banned the little toys that are put into our little premium toys. I, I think you're saner here, so you probably don't do these things, thank God. But, but if you're not familiar with it, they have little toys, often Disney-related, that are used to lure children into McDonald's and get mommy and daddy to buy them a so-called Happy Meal. A Happy Meal is not very happy, in fact. It has about 600 calories, um, which is actually over half of the calories that a child between the age of two and five should be eating on a daily basis. City of San Francisco banned these toys. And of course, McDonald's came back at them like a ton of bricks, bringing in their lawyers and everybody else, calling the city fathers and mothers, um, you know, food tyrants, food Nazis, you know, every other sort of disparaging term they could come up with to try to undo this unbelievably stupid action, supposedly, on the part of the city. The duly elected uh, leaders of the city who decided that it is in the best interest of the city and the health of the people who live there to not be over-marketed to, over-lured over, uh, into these places. So far, they've won. So far, they've held their ground. In other places, that hasn't always been the case. Um, so we're in another situation that is really troubling. Uh, I referred to Cleveland earlier. But in Cleveland, um, they, um, in addition to all the good work they were doing, and this was continuing the good work, they, like New York City, decided to ban the use of trans fats in, uh, in food that was being prepared in restaurants, particularly in fast food places. And so and they had the power to do that until the state of Ohio decided to preempt that right, that authority. In other words, the state took away the, the authority of the city to make laws and promulgate regulations with respect to food ingredients. Um, and you know, this was considered by people in Cleveland as a violation of their sovereignty, in effect. One city councilman who'd been at the forefront of this, all these food, great food advances in the city um, called, it, called that action um, pro-obesity, pro-diabetes, pro-death. That was the way he characterized the actions of the state with regard to this preemption. We're seeing more of this now. We're seeing states passing laws that will make it a criminal act for an individual to take photographs of a large factory farm, some of the like, humane society and folks that have gone inside these large factory operations um, where you know, they've been able to document through photography and put it up on YouTube. Um, you know, really despicable acts, things that really make you you know, if you make you avoid meat, if not become a vegetarian entirely. 
Um, <clears throat> there's several states now that have passed laws that criminalize this activity. So the industry is fighting back. They're fighting back hard. It's going to be difficult for the food policy councils to win these battles. It's going to take some particularly um, some particularly thoughtful maneuvering in order to avoid, in order to win on those things. Um, food policy councils have often had to avoid those fights because they have other serious and important things at stake that they don't want to sacrifice. So they've often avoid those confrontations with the food industry. But they are there, they're real, and they will certainly thwart a lot of the bigger gains that people want to make if they're interested in changing the food system. Um, the, I just want to, I want, as I was saying earlier, I wanted to just reference Edmonton uh, a little bit more because I was, I'm really um, admiring their work. I had the opportunity to go there last fall. Edmonton has developed a food uh, plan for the city, but it's a process which I think is more admirable than just the fact that they've developed a very good plan. Uh, they worked for over a year to engage uh, over 3,000 of their citizens in various uh, surveys, focus groups, um, meetings, trainings, um, public hearings, um, to really find out what they wanted <coughs> to achieve with their food system. They had one just they had one public meeting in particular, just one of many, they had over 700 people show up just to talk about the food plan. Again, this was, for Edmonton, this was as unprecedented as 300 people showing up for the chicken hearing in Missoula. They believe very strongly that the, the citizens have to be engaged, the stakeholders have to be engaged. Um, they, th they believe that uh, their work will be successful if they do that well. It'll be much more successful if they engage their citizens than if they just promulgate regulations. And interestingly, this was all inspired by their city planning department. In fact, they have three full-time people uh, assigned as food system specialists within their planning department. It's a city of 800,000 people. I was impressed that they made that kind of commitment. They spent $1 million on this planning process. Uh, so they actually committed resources to the whole, to the entire to the entire operation. They're looking at the, how, what other city plans have come along in their city. You know, oftentimes cities develop, they have this plan, or here's this report, or this study. Goes back five years, 15 years, 20 years. Nobody looks at it. It's sitting on the shelf somewhere. They actually dug through that stuff to try to find out what is going on, um, what has gone on, and what can we learn from the data that was gathered at an earlier time. Um, so uh, that to me is perhaps, I, I guess of, of all the things that I'm, you know, of all the examples that I'm considering, Edmonton probably is, is the Cadillac of food planning process, or maybe Cadillac's no longer the right car anymore. Maybe I should say Mercedes Benz, I don't know, but it certainly is the best example that I've been able to come up with. Um, I'm going to probably bring it to a close there. I think that there are some, well, I do want to say I think there's some important lessons that we've learned. I just want to share some of them. Um, I, again, I think that uh, we've learned that advocacy groups, food citizens, consumer groups can hold City Hall accountable. They can hold government accountable. And they certainly have to be at the table. If we don't have that transparency, if we don't have that participation, I don't think we can expect good policy, good food policies to emerge. Um, I think that um, you know, when, when these plans are put forward, the fact that it is necessary that the plan include a process of engagement, that there in fact be a food policy council established as a result of that food plan that in fact that food plan is much more likely to go somewhere, to be implemented over time if there's a body charged with actually overseeing its implementation. We're seeing there's a new, a new plan out in New York City called the Recipe for the Future of Food in New York City. Um, right at the front end of that report, they say we want to establish a food policy council. 
And in fact, there is a member of the New York City Food uh, of the New York City Council has introduced a bill to establish such a council. Oftentimes, when you're doing this work, you have to be content with small p policy as opposed to large p policy. Small p meaning that there's lots of administrative and programmatic actions that can be taken by government that don't require you know, major action by its, its legislative bodies. It doesn't require new laws or, or even new regulations. And it's that working together closely with those people. Um, again, that cross-sector, public-private partnership, which can yield a tremendous number of policy gains. I could go on for many, many, you know, my wife Pam can t give you lots of examples from New Mexico of just e of what, exactly what I mean. It isn't necessarily a big fight or a big confrontation or even a, a lengthy process that we're looking at. It is really often developing little policies, little wins. Um, we need to keep that big picture in front of us. It isn't just about one program here or one new initiative there. We need to be looking at that whole thing. Uh, as we say in New Mexico, the whole enchilada. Uh, we need to be thinking about you know, health, econ economy, and so forth. There really does need to be a maintenance of effort. Implementation is more important, far more important, really, than formulation of new policy. And that has to be right at the top. Um, too often, I've seen groups get celebrate the passage of the creation of a new policy. It's great, good work. They drop the ball when it comes to making sure that that policy is then implemented. You know, all those, all that good work and all those wins will go for naught unless you follow up. Um, and lastly, I think that we can't do enough at this stage to um, undertake good capacity building. One thing we found out at Johns Hopkins I didn't mention earlier is that very few groups are conducting any form of evaluation. There's a real you know, lack of good evaluation and research work being done by food policy councils because they often don't have the resources or the know-how. We need to be doing more of that. But capacity building all around is absolutely critical. So I'm gonna leave it there. And um, sorry, I've talked a little longer than I thought I would, but I, I do think that I'm, I'm so glad to be here again. I'm so glad that to have the opportunity to uh, work with some of you later on uh, tomorrow here in Cardiff. Uh, see Steve, Steve gave us this great tour uh, um, last time we were here, and I saw all the highlights of, of the Cardiff food system, some of which I wrote about in a blog. Once. Um, and uh, I wish you well, I think that there's I think you're really on right at the cusp of something enormously exciting and successful. So I'm here. I'm here to work with you. I have cards, um, and I, I have if students. If there are students here, I'm actually willing to talk to you uh, via email. You have projects. You have ideas. You want to chat about something. Grab a card. Be happy to, happy to you know, talk with you about your thoughts. So thanks for having me. <laughs>